everyone. Welcome to the 1000 Hours Outside podcast. Thrilled today to have Dr. Chris Winter. Dr. Chris Winter is a sleep specialist and neurologist and author of uh, two books, The Rested Child, which releases tomorrow um, as of the day that we're recording. So tomorrow, August 17th, and The Sleep Solution that was published in 2017. He's been dubbed the sleep whisperer. Everybody wants to know a sleep whisperer, right? <laughs> Um, has been involved in the field of sleep medicine for 25 years, a fully board certified neurologist and double board certified. I didn't even really know that was a thing. That's awesome. Sleep specialist, Dr. Winter has been helping individuals sleep better through his private clinic, group consultations, work with professional athletes and dynamic media presence. So the sleep solution is number one bestseller in sleep disorders. That was uh, from 2017, why your sleep is broken and how to fix it. And the rested child, why your tired, wired, or irritable child may have a sleep disorder, and how to help raising healthy sleepers from crib to college. That comes out tomorrow, August 17th. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for being here. No, no, no. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, Jenny. Yeah, so thrilled. So I had a, I had a chance to um to peruse through this book, The Rested Child. It is 17 chapters, and the, the titles of the chapters are so catchy and funny. <laughs> I love it. It's 352 pages. It's interesting. You know, I learned so much just from what I read in there. And um, I'm so it. glad that's, yeah. that's, that's the point, isn't it? Just to make people better informed so they can make better decisions. I think. Yeah. Just more aware. So yeah. We're going to talk about a, a couple of things that I kind of grabbed from the book, um, knowing that there's so much more that um, I'm still going through, but one of the things um, that I think would really interest um, our listeners is information about lux and lumens and full spectrum sunlight. We talk about that quite a bit, how not all light is created equal, that indoor light tends to just be for our vision, but that full spectrum sunlight uh, affects our entire body. So um, let's see, one of the things you say in the book is that light is one of the biggest influers, influences or in. <laughs> influencers on our sleep and circadian timing in general. So uh, you have this little section where you talk about the real versus the ideal. You know, that, you know, the ideal would be that kids get up and there's bright sun and all these different things. Uh, but that the ideal is we're getting up and we're getting on the bus and maybe school's not light enough and no one's outside. So can you talk, can you talk to us about, you know, what would be the ideal light situation for a child or, or even for an adult. I'm glad you, it's interesting you brought that chapter up first. I don't think, I, I bet I'll do a hundred interviews and that will not be the first thing that people brought up. But, you know, it's interesting. It was an important chapter to me because when I sat down to write the book, I felt like it was important to put things in there that people may not have already heard. I mean, I think most kids and most adults know it should be quiet in your bedroom and probably shouldn't have a computer in your bed, et cetera. But the whole lighting thing to me is just fascinating as a sleep specialist. And it was interesting because it was one of the things I had to fight to keep in there because there's a lot of editors and reviewers who were saying, oh, this is a little too technical. People aren't really going to be interested in that, but it fascinates me. So maybe people won't be interested in it, but I'm so glad that you were. And, and it's, it's really has to do with the idea of, like you said, what are the things that influence our sleep? At, at, a, at, a, in a, at a body level, sort of a scientific level, and light is a huge one. Um, and, and so, yeah, the ideal would be that we all sort of live outside in tents. And when the sun comes up, we get outside and sit around a campfire and make some pancakes. And we have our first you know lessons of the day. And then we run and play outside. And we're just sort of in tune with nature and the comings and goings of light. Um, now, if you live in Alaska or someplace where light can be scarce in the winter time, there may be a need or at least a benefit for artificial lighting. But I think that the average parent can learn a lot from just understanding that light intensity is important. So how bright the light is important is important, but also what makes up our lighting. And in you know generations past, everybody was either outside or using some sort of incandescent light bulb which produces a full spectrum of light, you know, the Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and a good violet. 
And energy efficient lighting is as wonderful it is potentially for our environment is is not entirely great for our wakefulness and sleep, depending on what the nature of that light is. So with some relatively simple tools, it's very easy for a parent to evaluate both the brightness of the light that their kids are exposed to, but also the quality of light. So you can get this little thing called a spectroscope. It looks like a tiny little uh, telescope and you can walk around your house and look at different lights and you will see the color spectrum that's coming out of those lights. Some are full, some have very bizarre little signatures, like a very bright orange, a little bit of green, and then some deep purple. And when you look at it, it doesn't look that color. It looks white or yellowy or bluey, but it doesn't look like it, it, it makes sense that those lights would combine to produce the light that you're seeing with your naked eye. But if you have a child who's sitting in his bedroom in the evening trying to do homework and the lighting intensity or the characteristics of the light are not good, then it could be working against your ability to either stay awake or sleep whenever you want to. And, and this is not even mentioning the lighting that they're using in the school. You know, as your child is trying to be awake and focused during the day, is that lighting working well? So when you go to back to school night, you can take your little thing and secretly look around your kid's classroom uh, and then you know, have a conversation with your, your teacher when, when, the, when the evening's over, I guess. I found this part fascinating and I'm really glad that you kept it in the book because it's easy, right? You know, I think it's it is as a parent to know that when you're exposed to full spectrum light, that's going to help your health. And that's going to help your rhythms. And what an easy thing. So, you know, for my childhood, back in the 80s, we walked to school. It was a mile. You know, we had morning recess. We had two afternoon recesses. We walked home. And I had read in, um, in a different book about how the, the sunlight, it guides you through the day, the colors. You know, kind of Absolutely. what you're talking about, that how, you know, when that sun goes down, it's this natural signal to your body to start to slow down. Um, and so I just really love what you talked in here about Lux and Lumens. And we ordered, we ordered one of the things, you know? <laughs> I'm excited people. about that. Well, you know, it's interesting. Walk, you know, if somebody said, look, we, we want our kid to be as healthy as he can be, what, what should we do? I would say walking to school is probably about at the top of the list because think about it. You're getting up, you're getting outside. So you're going from a dark bedroom to a bright, you know, walk for in the morning. You're probably walking with friends. So you're getting social interaction. You're getting exercise. You're warming your body through the walking. Um, it's something that's happening at the same time every day. And you've probably got some food either in your hand as you walk or you ate right before you walked out the door. Those are fantastic, you know, things to sort of establish a rhythm. There's one of my friends who's a sleep doctor up in, uh, a specialist up in um, Minnesota. She takes her kids camping the week before school starts to really help to get that rhythm going and then wow. kind of shake off the summer. So, but anyway, I'm going to be very interested to hear what you find out about the light in your house. Um, so we'll have to, re you'll have to report yes. back and we'll talk about that. That'll be really interesting. Right. But your listeners would love to hear that. Yeah. And I didn't realize how that there were tools that you could test it with. A lot of people ask about, well, what about on a cloudy day? You know, and it's still so much brighter than it would oh, yeah. be indoors. You know, so even on a cloudy day, that's going to help reset your systems. I think all of it is counterintuitive. You know, how can morning sunlight affect your nighttime sleep? So that's why I'm so glad you included it in the book. What a, what a simple solution. You know, yeah. to school. And, and you're going to be so, you're going to be so interested. It's so interesting too, to have that little light meter and, and to, to go outside on a sunny day and see what, you know, 20,000 lux or whatever. And then on a cloudy day is still 10,000 outside. You know, so it's versus your living room where your one child likes to do his homework is 28 or something. You know, it's, right. it's really staggering sometimes. In fact, I always take these things with me when I go talk to professional sports teams. And it's always interesting to like look in their locker room. So your players are coming off this bright, energetic court and they come into the locker room in the evening, you know, and for halftime and they go back out. Well, you're kind of putting your players to sleep in here. You know, the lighting's all wrong. Like this would be much better lighting for after the game when they're trying to get ready to sleep the upcoming night. So I think everybody can learn from these types of things. Right. And I think it's a missed, uh, um, a missed thing that light matters. 
you know, I, I never knew, you know, so light is light, you know, it's helping you see, but it really matters. I liked one of the things you said in here was that the main source of light in a child's life is not the sun. You call it the main G or the G type main sequence star of superheated plasma. We call the sun. This is entertaining writing. I love it. But you said the main source of light often is this phone screen. Um, and so it is something that has changed. And I think it's something really important uh, to talk about. So I, I appreciate that. That's exciting. Good, um, good, good. And you talked about full spectrum sunlight and the different, you know, colors and the different wavelengths and especially this blue light, which, you know, you hear people talk about blue light and screens. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. So, we, you know, it, talking about the intensity of the light, you can also look at the sort of the nature of what's coming out of it and, and screens are dangerous because if they if your child is on a screen a lot it's kind of like you said when you were growing up you were sort of guided by the sun you walked to school when it was you know bright outside you sat in school and as the sun kind of went down in the evening when you're out there playing you know softball at the end of the day your eyes were kind of aware of the fact that we are slowly losing light i remember when i would we would have baseball practice. Our, our field was not lit in our high school. So at some point it got, it came, it became a little dangerous because you couldn't quite see the ball until it was kind of right up <laughs> on you. And that's when the coach said, okay, it's time to be mm -hmm. done. But you know, all of us were out there as that sunlight was slowly going away. And that's a very powerful trigger for our brains to release the chemical melatonin. And so we call it actually DLMO, dim light melatonin onset. So our brains really respond to that loss of signal. Now, if your child is not playing softball or baseball and is always on a phone, they're always getting sort of a constant amount of blue light in their face, which kind of fools the brain into thinking the day never ends, um, which can be really problematic for, like you said, not only just going to sleep that night, but the entire 24 hours where your brain's trying to make a schedule. It's like you're trying to make a schedule for your family. And every time you look at your watch, it says 6 p.m. Like it's hard to kind of understand where you are in time if that watch is sort of stuck. And that's kind of what happens when individuals are constantly exposed to what their brain thinks is lunchtime sun. So it's very important to create situations where we see that rise and flow of uh, rise and fall of, of light uh, in our day. And, and sometimes if you've got kids who are, have to be on computers, I mean, our kids, as they got older, their assignments were on a computer, their readings were on the computer, their communications with teachers were on the computer. So it wasn't like, like when, back when we grew up, dad could just take the computer and I'm going to throw it in the lake. Or, you know, my dad always right. threatened to throw items out of a window for some reason. <laughs> Um, and, and if he did, you'd be like, okay, well, he just threw my little Nintendo out of the window, but I've still got my books and my catcher and the rye copy. I can still do my homework. That's not really the case now. So you may have to do things that, that alter the light that your kids are seeing, like wearing blue blocking glasses or something like that to try to help keep that rhythm established for your children. Yeah, I think that um, reading your book helped me to understand those blue light blockers more you know, and what they're doing, and then they're helping the kids with the rhythm. Um, so you talked in this book about, you know, our 24-hour clock, and something that I learned that I didn't know before um, was with your graphs, which I found completely fascinating, where you graphed the temperature, you know, that oh, yeah. the body temperature <laughs> rises and falls, and you got this graph, you know, that, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like maybe it falls, you know, as, as the night comes, or as we're getting ready to go to sleep, we have this- That's right this this curve and that people's curves can be shifted a little bit and I found that that was fascinating because um so for example my mom is a night night owl my dad you know he's a, he, at nine o'clock he is asleep I mean he is out you can't talk to him but he's up at five and so they have this funny thing where when they go on vacation you know together and they're coming up to their retirement years you know they go on vacation and my mom says you know it's eight o'clock in the morning and she wakes up and my dad's sitting there and he's already run five miles and he's showered and he's just sitting there waiting for her to go. But you know that they're where they're sort of um, their curve falls is just slightly uh, different. And so, um, you know, what is this correlation between body temperature and sleep and this curve? And should we be trying to move it for our kids or do we kind of um, yeah. just kind of take their natural um, 
habits and, and try and work with them? What do you think about that? Yeah. So what's your, I, I, I'm so glad. It's so interesting to talk to people who haven't, I've been around this book for so long, you kind of lose all sense of objectiveness, like what's good and what's bad. Like it just all kind of runs together. And this was another part that I found really fun to, to write about just because I thought it was something fresh that the idea that our circadian rhythm, we talk a lot about in relationship to sleep, but it also has to do with when we're hungry or when we're best able to take a spelling test or when we're most likely to you know, hit a home run in a baseball game. It governs everything about our bodies. It's just that we don't actually, I can't look at you and see your body temperature. Oh, she looks a little hot right now. She looks a lot hotter now than she did at the beginning of this interview. She seemed cooler than like, you can't tell that. I can't tell when your bones are making red blood cells, your digestion is at its best, but we can see sleep. And maybe more people now have been seeing temperature because we're checking temperatures all the time because of COVID. Um, so what you're referring to is I have this little thermometer I can stick on my forehead and immediately get a reading. And so everything that circadian rhythm researchers do is generally based upon body temperature and not the fun thermometer usually. But anyway, um, so I, when I had this thermometer, I thought it'd be kind of fun to check my temperature every 15 minutes and see if my curve looks like what all the research does. And of course it does. And then it's just like you said, it tends to peak around four to six o'clock in the evening. And then it suddenly starts to kind of drop off and we start to rise again about an hour before we wake up in general. Now, if you're a night owl, all of that kind of gets pushed later. So instead of a four o'clock peak, maybe it's a seven o'clock peak. And instead of it starting to rise at 5 a.m., maybe it starts to rise at you know 8 a.m. or something of that nature. Um, so I'm a night owl, and that's exactly kind of how I feel. And when I plotted my rhythm out, that's kind of what I saw. My wife, who's much more of a morning person, you can think of her temperatures as starting to fall earlier. And this is often the reason why people will fight over the thermostat at night. You know, if you were to check in on our house at some random evening, you might see me sitting there after work, like in my underwear and dress socks, you know, my wife's, oh God, get some clothes on for heaven's sake. <laughs> and she's, you know, in a blanket. But, and, and we've all felt it like when you were in school, if you had to stay up really late one night, like all of a sudden you were cold, and you had to pull the blanket off your bed and put it around you as you studied for your art history final or whatever you had to do. Um, it's because you feel that, that, that temperature drop at some point in the night. So it's a great marker for circadian rhythms. Can you change it? You can, but it does take work. But I think understanding these rhythms is really important. Not so much so, you know, if your daughter's making her red blood cells, but really about when is she at her best or worst? Because the average child is going to intellectually peak around three or four in the afternoon when school's over. So I was just hosting a, a show last night about kids and sleep. And somebody said, you know, what do you think about homeschooling? Is it good or bad? You know, what we've seen a lot in this pandemic. And my answer was, I think it can be quite good as long as you're structured about it. But if you've got a child who's really night oriented and, and feels great at four o'clock, it's really a shame that they have to take their calculus at 830 in the morning. Right. You know, if you could have, if every kid could have their schedule sort of adapted to them, I think right. there'd be a lot more academic achievement. So if you can't do that, Chris, our kids have to go to this public school and she wants to take calculus, but it's only offered at 830 and she's a real night owl then I think it's helpful for parents to understand some of the things that we talked about in the book about, okay, well, how can we make her a bit more morning oriented and more likely to succeed in the morning? Right. And, and you have all sorts of easy ideas, which is get outside, get moving yeah. if you can. Go walk to school. Yeah. Walk to school. Walk to school. Like, sure. like, you know, it's true. Sure. I, you know, um, when you look at kids, you know, who swim in the morning, like my son is my youngest, my youngest is a rower. My oldest is a swimmer. And, you know, every morning at 530, he got up and yes. swam. And, nobody and likes school. that. You know, the nobody's swim, interested in that. But schedule is intense. It's it is. But, but man, when they get to school, they are ready. They've been exercising in this brightly lit pool around other people, exercising, heating their body for 30 minutes uh, or for three hours. So they're ready for first period. You have to watch out with those kids that they don't have calculus at the end of the day because right. they can really slump, you know, prior to that time. So it's just trying to create healthy environments for all of our kids until they they grow up and can kind of choose their own schedule if they can, if they're a 
nurse or something, maybe they won't be able to do that. Well, and I kind of like, to your point, then it's like, well, if you can't choose your own schedule, then hear what you're offering are tips, you know, to help you adjust. And so I really love the book, you know, because it's, it's called The Rested Child. And, you know, you think this is about sleep, but it's really about life. It's also about living. And, um, and these are all really helpful things to know. And, and, you know, if you have more than one child, you can kind of look and you can accommodate for them and you can help them adapt and you can you know and if they struggle with a certain class period you know sometimes maybe there's a reason or that's right absolutely so I, I like that it gives an answer to problems maybe that are arising we're a homeschooling family and I know homeschooling is on the rise so I also like what you said about that that it you know if you are a homeschooling family you can use that rhythm the body rhythm and and work toward individuality there so you know, what a gift. And um, I had no idea that we peak around, you know, three or four o'clock or depending on where you're, you know, yeah, you're, absolutely. You're and you and ball. you as a parent know, and my wife's a teacher and we, we talked about homeschooling our kids every year. Like it was always a discussion. And, you know, when you look at some of the research about kids and sleep and development and all this timing that, you know, an intelligent homeschool situation could be far better than the situation that some kids are in where they have to get up and go to grandma's house to catch the bus because their parents have to be, you know, there's so many things that can be negative about an in-person learning. Now, the one nice thing is you do have some structure. Every day, the kids do the same thing every day. So I think that in a homeschooling environment, you have to be careful about the, okay, we'll just do English whenever we want to today. So I think it's important to have a schedule, but your schedule might not start until 11 or you, know, like you let you your said, kids you know, sleep you later. Yeah. The morning, maybe outdoor time. Right. You know, Absolutely. Yes. You know, the schoolwork is, you know, an after lunch period or, you know, and then it kind of goes over that part where they're in their peak. Learning or have your classes outside. My son did a semester of his junior year of high school in Boise and they were often outside doing classwork or on some yeah. sort of expedition. And okay, you wake up and you cook over your fire. And then we sit in our little camp chairs and we do our AP US history outside in the sunlight. I mean, nothing could be better. Nothing's better. I remember that as a kid. I remember being in elementary school and at the end of the year, you know, the teacher would take out a big blanket and she'd take out the book that we were reading. I mean, those are the things I so really good. remember. It's so simple. It is. And I don't remember them too. I'm thinking about Sylvia Hendricks, my eighth grade English teacher. And she would often go out there and we would like, uh, we would conjugate verbs. I walk, you walk, he, she, it walks, they walk. Like, you know, we would do all these past participles. And I remember walking wow. in the woods and doing that it was so much fun. Isn't that amazing? I just, I think because there's so much more sensory stimulation, those yeah. things tend to stick. I liked what you wrote in here about the pattern of our body temperature rises and falls in a predictable way, just like the tides or a sunrise and sunset. That is beautiful. That our body we, we are part of nature. We are yes. we are not meant to be extracted from it. It doesn't mean you can always be connected to it, but we're 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 very tied to this. There's a reason why our body has its own intrinsic 24-hour rhythm, just like our our world. They're they're kind of right. hooked together. Right. So I've written um, down some notes in here about dopamine um, because yeah. you talked about uh, TV, TV and video games and cell phones and they, they produce this response and that dopamine produces wakefulness and facilitates addiction. So I thought this was really interesting because especially I think you're talking about if kids are on these devices as they're supposed to be falling asleep, but they're promoting wakefulness and addiction, I, I'm imagining that this is really affecting um, whether or not they're rested. Yeah, I, I think somebody asked me, what are the biggest threats to, what, what are the things that worry you most about kids and sleep? And I said, it's school and technology. And, and in terms of school, my wife's a teacher, both of my parents were school teachers. This is not, a, I'm not worried about school. It's just sometimes the way things are structured runs counter what a body needs for its sleep. But the technology piece is, is really concerning. And, and like you said, dopamine is a neurotransmitter in our brain that does amazing things and has a variety of different um, uh, jobs in our brain. And, and it's that combination of wakefulness 
an addiction that is sort of problematic. I mean, if you ask me, I've got three kids myself. What is the hardest thing about raising kids? I, I would say is is the technology. And my oldest is is mm. is twenty two, so it's yeah. been. They all came about at different times. I feel like she sort of escaped the worst of it. And with each successive kid, it was just, there was just more of it to be consumed. And it is a drug. I mean, and and people who design apps and games will tell you, we are very much in the, in the business of manipulating your dopamine. And, you know, we, I've seen games that they play, this is the silliest game ever. It's so easy. Well, of course it's easy because it's easy to master, which gives you a little hit of dopamine and you get big scores and, there's lots of interesting things that go along with it that, that are just, they're not, it's not Atari Pong where right, there actually right. was kind of a skill to it and very right. simple. It's really meant to get you coming back for the second game. Um, yeah. I remember video games when we were, you put a quarter in it and like the game would be over in two minutes. Yeah. Like, this is a really yeah. hard game. I don't know how to, but then you're like, I don't want to waste any more money on this. Right. They don't want that anymore. They want the game to last a long time to really yeah. embed itself in you. And so um, you know, our kids, we have a rule that, that phones live in the kitchen. And a lot of times, you know, they would sneak their phones up there. Or my son actually made a little pretend phone out of wood. And so he would plug the pretend phone up, but he, all along he had the real phone upstairs. And I describe him as a very good kid, but he, yeah. they just want to be on that phone yeah. and then their peers are on it. So it's just very difficult wow. to get the rest you need when you've got that thing in your life. And even when they don't have it, I just picture them up there in their beds like, oh, I wish I had my phone. I wish oh. I could like, what's going on with my phone? Who's texting me right now? So well, that's interesting. They're just wired. I like to, I think you said phone sleep in the kitchen, which I thought that was, I like that phraseology, you know? Yeah, that's, that's where we chose it. And, and I think it's know? important for parents to model that too. So um, now, if you're on call or something, you know, as a parent, because somebody might have an emergency, that might be different. But, you know, my wife and I also plug our phones up so anybody can walk down there and see whose phones are there because everybody has their little spot and, and whose are not. And so I think it's important for parents to to model that same sort of behavior, too, and that it's not, well, you all have your phones there, but we get to yeah. keep ours in our bedroom. I don't think yeah. that's probably a good idea. I like that. I like that idea of you say in the book that you're a sleep guy, not a technology guy, but the but the things are really going hand in hand. Uh, it's well, my like, guess is you're you're a teaching podcast woman and maybe not a technology woman, but here we are on technology, yeah, and hand. it's hard to separate those things, isn't it? Yeah. Well, our movement is about bringing back balance. You know, I say kids are outside for yes. four to seven minutes a day, but four to seven hours on screen. So you know, there's just some imbalance there. And oh, wow. Um, that's 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 yeah. impressive. should be on a t-shirt and that uh it should be so i think that's that's probably affecting sleep oh there's no there's it. no doubt about it i mean yeah. the we, we've talked about the life but just also the play and the exercise and that's also a dangerous thing about a video game is that you're running through a world collecting objects and i don't know shooting people which is a terrible thing to think about but it gives the the child the impression they've done something well yeah. dad i i ran all through this world collected all this gold and built a castle today what did you do you yeah. just sat up there talking to patients and you really didn't do anything so that outdoor play and exposure is so important to sleep and people ask me what's the one thing i can do today that'll make my sleep better it's get up in the morning and exercise for 30 minutes i yes. mean it's I, yes. I no, at the same list. time every day it's no, I, so yes. important that's not, that actually is something I didn't realize, you know, it's like, oh, you know, and, and I think exercise is important wherever you can get it in, right? The best time to exercise is whenever you're doing it, but, but, you know, to have a little bit of a guidance, you know, well, this is going to warm my body up. This is going to help me with my temperature curve. So I did get that also out of your book. I thought that was, that was really interesting. Um, talk to me about serotonin and melatonin um, and, and maybe the, the connection to light there. You know, I read that light helps your body produce serotonin, uh, which makes you feel good. Absolutely. So this is another really interesting thing too, is as you look at sleep, I'm a neurologist, you know, psychiatry, psychology. It's been interesting to see even over my career, 
how they've all kind of come together. They used to be very different things. And, you know, we talked about using a light box in the morning for seasonal affective disorder, people who may struggle a little bit with their mood, particularly in the winter time, or if you live in a place that's very dark, you know, like a place like Alaska right, or something right. like that. And so we always talked about, yeah, when you use this light, it kind of facilitates things like serotonin um, that allow you to feel better. Um, well, there's other things you can do to, to facilitate serotonin. You could take a medication like Prozac or Zoloft and, and they tend to boost serotonin as well too, which are perfectly reasonable treatments for people who are struggling with their mood. But then the real question becomes, well, what, what can we do intrinsically to, to make these things better besides light and maybe taking a medication? Well, exercise, social interactions, hobbies, you know, relationships, you know, uh, intimate relationships with other people, all these things are wildly productive of serotonin. And they're all the things that people get rid of when they're struggling with their mood. Well, I've been struggling lately. I'm not being my best. And I've just kind of stopped going to the gym. And I used to love to play my guitar and paint and I don't do that anymore. And I just don't feel as connected with my partner or what. So all of these things are important that we understand that whatever we do to kind of move our mood in the right direction, that we really try to pull these things back into our lives because they're sort of the generator that will keep that serotonin machine working as well as it can. And so sleep really plays a strong role in that. These neurotransmitters that we look at that involve ourselves in mood are very involved with the, the quality and functioning of our sleep as well too. I mean, I love those things, Chris. It's like back to the simple, right? You know, really it is. Sick. No, absolutely. It, it, it was always there. It's just, yeah. it takes science a hundred years to yeah. explain. This is why your grandmother kind of told you all these things about yes, sleep. Like, you know, it's like sleep and getting sick. Oh, you better get your sleep or you'll get sick. Well, yes. it took a long time for science to figure out why exactly is, is that, is that true? Number one. And if it is why, and you know, we've kind of figured those things out now, but yeah, yeah they're very simple things and things that tend to kind of make intrinsic sense. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things I noticed um, is right on the cover of your book, you talk, there's this crib to college subtitle. And I thought that that was really interesting because, you know, I think, and I could be wrong, but it seems like up until somewhat recently, the sleep has been really focused on infants. You know, so many books out there about infant sleep and, you know, parents are exhausted, right? So, yeah, you know, yeah. it's a good, it's a good target. We see a lot, we see a lot of those. Yes. Yeah, we've got five kids. So, you know, I was always trying, I mean, I tried all the things, you know, you just got to give it time, I think. But, you know, I do think getting babies outside in the morning helps, you know, with oh, that. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, but, yeah. But, we had a little light box on our changing table. So first thing in the morning, oh, change the diaper, wow. turn the light on so they get that little light. They don't, it's just passive. It's just sitting there. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely. Get well, them that's outside. A, that's a brilliant little tip is a light box on a changing table. Yeah. So that they can help to establish their rhythms. Um, but but now you have, you have from crib to college. And so I have not seen that many books, you know, that are talking about sleep for teens, you know, and is, so is this a newer thing that people are needing to talk about because of screens or has it always sort of been an issue? I know I just hear parents say the same thing as you, you know, they're on their phone till one or two in the morning. I can't get them up, that type of thing. Um, are, you, are you seeing this more and more? Yes. So you said so many amazing things there. I will go back to the light box on the changing table. You know, if you've decided that you want your child to wake up around seven o'clock in the morning, if she wakes up at six, that's fine. What I would do is just kind of hold her, try to be very calm and not really that engaged and then try to hold off the feeding if you can. And then at seven o'clock, we pop them up on the table, light turns on, open up the window, feed the baby. So even if the baby's not quite on the schedule, you try to control that light happening at the same time every day. It's, uh, it does wonders for getting your kid on a schedule very quickly. Your point is a very important one. When I wrote my first book, um, I, I thought I, I really like it. I'm very proud of that book and it's done well, but I feel like if it had never come into existence, the world would have been okay. <laughs> when I wrote this book, it was really an outgrowth of the fact that I see adults and kids in my clinic and we only treat sleep problems. And it was a combination of the rise in kids that we see who struggle with their sleep, either I can't sleep 
or I can't stay awake. Like my kid's tired all the time and they're just calling him depressed. But as a parent, I don't think he's depressed or I don't think he has ADHD. I feel like there's something going on that we're missing. So it was the combination of the rise in disorders that we see. And just like you said, if you talk about kids and sleep book, people will name off the books that they got when they had new babies about how to get your kid to sleep through the night and take some regular naps. Very important books. There's some wonderful ones out there. I used them myself when I was a, a, a young parent. But it's sort of like there's this idea that once your kid's sleeping through the night, they're good until you know they've got their first job. And there's so many things that threaten the sleep of our children that are, to me, even more important because I've never met a, a kid who's like in the fifth grade who come, the parents come in and say, yep, well, we never got them on a schedule. <laughs> It'll happen. Right. It's just about how quickly it's going to happen, but kids will get right. on a schedule. So we focus so much attention on getting the kid to sleep through the night that all of the real disorders that threaten their mental health, their academic achievement, their physical abilities, we just ignore. And there's reasons for it. Um, and it was funny because when I was talking to my publisher about the book, they're like, oh, we've got plenty of these books. I'm like, no, you don't. You actually don't have any of these right. books. You're thinking about that book that, you know, cry it out or don't cry it out or whatever right. the theory is. So to me, it was really important to get this book out there because like you said, there's this sort of vacuum. And then the problem also becomes that you think, well, even if I don't understand it, my doctors will figure these things out in my kids and get them diagnosed appropriately. No, they won't. They did a research study that looked at 157 pediatrician training programs around the world. The average kid doc is getting about four hours of training and sleep over the four years of training and the four years of medical school. So in eight years, you get four hours. About a quarter of kid doctors get no training and sleep. Wow. So this idea that we'll just kind of leave it to the experts, we're not training people about these disorders. We, they don't know about them. So you're likely to get a dismissive nod or yeah. here, just have them take some melatonin gummy bears or just some, right. you know, so it's amazing the number of people that I see that I'm like, what did your doctor tell you about this? Or how did you end up coming here? It's the parent that said, I demand to see the sleep specialist and yeah. not the, so I just figured, you know what, let's just go right to the parents. They know their kids better than anybody on the planet. And if we could educate them to advocate for their kids, we can maybe make a dent in this hidden crisis that we've got with sleep. I mean, think about this in terms of pediatric problems, a child is about two out of every three kids between cradle to college will have a sleep problem. That's you know, so that's what that's 66 percent right yeah. i mean i know mine are, so if you look at if the incidence of diabetes is not 66 percent, it's about a quarter of a percent um uh depressions four percent adhd nine percent obesity 18 percent sleep disorders 66 percent. even if you cut it in half and said that's too much 30 percent. that's still a massive number of yeah. kids that we've got huge problems and no foundation to help fix that. And these kids are getting misdiagnosed with mental problems. And, and when we miss these diagnoses, they develop all kinds of issues with, with, right. with esteem and performance. And so it's just an awful situation. And the pandemic has definitely not made it better. Sure. Well, when you talked earlier about those things, about relationships and hobbies and outdoors and all those things that you know just tend to help you have a better sense of well-being and hugs See, seeing yeah. people other than your parents and having some right. physical connection with them it's right. really interesting to see what happens when you remove all that and you live yeah. virtually it's not healthy yeah. well chris i mean that real that that little subtitle it's like up in the corner i see your book right there it's up in the corner right where it says from crib to college that really caught my attention and i think you know, it, it, it's that little trigger reminds you like, oh, I should be paying attention to this past the age of, you know, three or four or two or whenever they start to sleep through the night that, you know, this is an important thing to, to know about, you know, and, and to understand. So, um, you know, I and I think, and I think like most that. parents would read this and think, 
I see a lot of my kids in this. I mean, there's certain, I mean, you know, the, the, the hidden epidemic of some chemical in your food, maybe it is, but I think that, you know, this book, when you read it, you think, wow, I I've seen this in my kids, or I see this in my kids, my friend, my sister's kids, or, you know, we all know people who are struggling with their sleep. And like I said, once you get your kids sleeping through the night, your work is just beginning. I think as a parent, it's not over. Yeah. And I let the correlation, you know, like you talked about, there's a press, the chapter about depression. And I think that could be, that could be a good chapter for anyone, child or not. Oh, you know, gosh, know or, yeah, or adult, and yes, absolutely. And other things um, as well for all of us that are maybe on our phones until late or, or different things. So absolutely. Um, so I just, I want you to know, I really enjoyed the book. I was fascinated. I learned so many things um, that were applicable to, to my own parenting, to myself. Um, and I haven't even finished it, you know, so I'm not got the, well, that's, that's, that's so exciting to hear because you, you wonder if it's just like, oh, your book's not good. That You you wake up at three in the morning and think, oh gosh, what if it's terrible? So it's so nice to hear you say these things about it. I'm yeah, I mean, really I learned so much. That. It's fascinating. It's well written. So if people are looking to learn more about the book, learn more about you, where should they go? So um, I, I tend to be mainly active on Twitter, and my handle is Sport Sleep Doc S P O R T S L E E P D O C. Just because I work with a lot of sports teams, yeah, like not that. a huge sports fan, but it's fun to work with an athlete and see their performance get better. Um, so I'm on Instagram and Twitter is at Sport Sleep Doc. I have a web page. It's um, www. Winter. Com. Um, would be, and then, you know, we host, I, I work with sleep.com and I host two rooms a week on the app clubhouse, uh, Thursdays at 5 PM, Sundays at 10 PM. And it's so much fun because even though I'm the host, I get to invite sleep experts and sleep adjacent, you know, people that I look up to from all over the world and, and have them as guests on our show. So each week we do two topics that yesterday we were doing kids and sleep this Thursday, we'll do something we call junk sleep. Um, and it's a wonderful way to sit and listen as you walk your dog, or you can raise your hand and participate and ask questions. So instead of just sort of being one directional, it's almost like a little mini conference. And so we've got a really big following on there and really they're dedicated to putting out great sleep information for people to, to hear. Well, that's fantastic. And they can find your book, I'm sure on Amazon or Amazon, it will be on, I think, Audible uh, at soon, okay. uh, Barnes and Noble. Uh, you can look at the Penguin Random House site, but the easiest yeah. place to grab it's probably just Amazon and yeah. really appreciate any feedback your your listeners have about it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I know. I know all that. All of that helps. So you give a review, you know, leave some information books. <laughs> it is so much work. And that's a that's a hefty book. It's 350 pages. So it is. Yeah. We, we, it, it, that, that's probably the hardest part of writing it is you have an editor saying we got to cut some stuff out, Chris, it's getting too long. And so, but hopefully it's a light, I don't think that I write oh, terribly it heavy. So it hopefully you, you'll find your reading through it very quickly. And you feel like you get your money's worth, right? Cause you get a lot. Of I hope so. Yeah, I yeah. think, I, I think so. I always tell my patients, like if you buy my book and hate it, I'll, I'll figure out a way to buy it back from you, maybe. <laughs> no, <laughs> so it's a great book. I hope you get your money's it's a worth great out book. of it. I was super interesting. So if if there was one little quip of wisdom, actually, I, I feel like I'm going to fill it in. But one little quip of wisdom you could give parents, something that they could do right now. I'm kind of thinking it's the walk to school thing. I was about to say, I mean, there was a reason why your podcast was so appealing to our team, which was outside. And I remember saying, I said, I like this podcast. <laughs> You're like, well, <laughs> let's look at parenting. I said, well, it is parenting and it's about being outside. And I think that the little quip would be, maybe you don't have seven hours to spend outside, but I'll bet you have more than seven minutes. So it's like everything else. You know, if you need to lose a hundred pounds, start with losing five pounds. And if that's works, then lose another five. So to me, it's, can we, can we figure out a way to spend 30 minutes outside? Yeah. Or like you said, maybe even better, just walk to school if you can do it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Or if you're homeschooling, get out in the morning. Or if you're if you're a parent, drop your kids off a half mile away from school and then just drive away. And then now they have to walk the last half. Yeah. Oh, why that. aren't you driving all the way to yeah. school? Ah, you walk the last half hour. It'll that's be so, it'll half so. mile will be good for you. Gives them some independence. Chris, right. let's end with this. Uh, tell us a favorite outdoor childhood memory of yours. So. I grew up in Southwest 
Virginia in, in Salem, Roanoke area. And my my father and his brothers had a little cabin up in Green Bank, West Virginia, which is this middle of nowhere place in West Virginia where there's this big radio observatory, like all the things that listen in space for aliens and you know stuff like that. So when you drive there, cell phones don't work. There's very few power lines that are above ground because they want to keep all the electrostatic uh, resistance uh, or, or interference to a minimum. So my favorite sort of outdoor memories were driving up to the cab. We always call it the cabin or mm -hmm. camp when we were, would drive up to camp. Um, and it was just so much fun to be outside. Uh, and there was this great place where they had kind of uh, dug into the side of a little hill to get some rock, I guess, to fill in a foundation. But when you go and pull out the little pieces of 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 of, of line of, of um, sedimentary rock, there were often fossils in them. So my sister and I would tie ropes onto the trees, and we would hang there on the side of this little hill and pull wow. out rocks and just find oodles of fossils. So that was just, and we'd be out there until we couldn't see, and you know, run home. And it was just the coolest place. So I, I still we take our kids up there and That's awesome. um, it's a really special place yeah and you can write if you if your listeners want something to do if they live near green bank west virginia you can actually take your bicycles and ride along the campus of this observatory and it's so cool for kids to be riding their you know big boy and big girl bikes next to these massive telescopes and i think once a year they have telescope day where you can actually go inside them Wow. Um, so it's a really cool place if you're kind of in that area there's Seneca rocks you can do some climbing or there's some caverns and there's something also called the Greenbrier River Trail which is that one of those rails to trails uh -huh. and it's perfectly flat along a cool river so neat little place to get out get your some of your hours outside I love that I love that and get in uh, have your body start releasing the serotonin right that's right right you're that's exactly right time. Uh, Chris, it was just an absolute delight and pleasure to talk to you, to read your book, to learn more about you. So uh, everyone who's listening, you got to check it out. The Rested Child uh, from crib to college. You're going to be helping your kids with their sleep. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Hey, my pleasure. You have a great day. You too.